Um, hi everyone. Um, I've flown in from Malta. I don't know if you've heard about us. <laughs> uh, we're making a bit of noise in the blockchain space. Um, I'm senior VP of Blockchain Generation. It's a boutique, um, basically, company that provides consultancy in the blockchain space. So we assess ICOs, STOs, take them on board, and we also plug in funding and help them with the frameworks. Um, but more importantly, the subject of the day is um, equity or tokens. The big question. So um, most of the time, when you do take on an ICO, so from a VC perspective, a VC point of view, when you take on a white paper, you look into an ICO, um, the question is whether you want to go in with equity or the potential of also having tokenized sales. Um, from, uh, from my uh, experience with blockchain generation, we've plugged in about 150 ICOs and were successfully funded up to $800 million. We're looking to continue doing that over the next few years with offices um, all over the world. We've plugged one in now in Malta, which is what I'm spearheading and for the whole of the EU. And our intentions are to continue to assess and look into ways of finding the best ICOs and how to fund them and move the projects forward on a global scale. What do you guys think about um, taking on an ICO and how you would assess it? What would bring you to the decision of whether it's equity or tokenizing? Um, I mean, I think the first point we always ask is uh, whether they actually need a blockchain. Because Fantastic. what we've seen uh, in particular in the past year was uh, companies uh, trying to superimpose blockchain on their solution even though they really didn't need it. Just because it was popular, it was easy to raise money through ICOs. So this is for sure the first point. And then, of course, we look at you know, the team, uh, the token metrics, and the, basically whether they optimize the value for the token or for the equity. Um, at Eterna Capital, we have invested in both uh, equity and tokens. Okay. So I think this is pretty much a case-to-case -case based on how the company is structured. Right. Sorry, Andrea, tell us what you guys do as well. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. that might be so, uh, Just exactly. to, to, to the interest as well. Fantastic. So I'm the founding partner and the CEO at uh, Eterna Capital. Eterna Capital is uh, an investment fund focused on uh, blockchain technology. Uh, I started up uh, Eterna alongside uh, three ex-BlackRock employees from London. I'm Sean. I'm with ProFounders Capital. Um, so as a way of background, I've been in London now for 13 years doing traditional venture capital investments in equity into early stage digitally enabled business, businesses. Um, for us, digitally enabled uh, gives us broad remit to invest into any kind of technology. Uh, we invested into Unity, the games engine that powers every one of the f games you play on your phone, um, through to e-commerce companies, through to B2B SaaS companies, um, and obviously blockchain is a new technology that we've been following for the last few years. Now, um, I am a VC investor during the day. What I love to do in the evening is read about game theory and um, how, how um, people should respond and interactions between different groups. And so the analogy that I draw with, um, with blockchain is something I was thinking that, that kind of hit me four or five years ago, which was equity crowdfunding. Um, I kind of sat there and I said, oh, isn't this nice? A company raised 200K uh, in equity crowdfunding on one of these platforms. And I thought to myself, boy, if you're an angel, you should be a little bit worried. And then fast forward about a year, and all of a sudden companies are raising two million pounds in equity crowdfunding. And I thought to myself, boy, I'm a VC. I should be worried now about what's going on in this world. And we started thinking about how we can interact with this community and look what was going on. And now if we fast forward a few more years to ICO's blockchain world, um, what was interesting is as we watched it kind of develop, it was the inverse of what happened in the equity crowdfunding, where I looked at it and said, oh, wow, companies are raising, Filecoin's raising $150 million in an ICO. <laughs> OK, interesting. Um, but then when I dug into the numbers, I realized over the course of last year, the average ICO was about $9 million or so. And I thought to myself, excuse the language, holy shit, like, that's, that's me. I'm being disrupted now. And as a firm that invests in digital disruption, once again, we need to be thinking about what's going on here. Why is someone doing ICO versus equity crowdfunding? And so I started analyzing it from that perspective. And if I had the desire, or I, not desire, I would, I, there's so many great kind of thesis projects and um, research projects to be done on entrepreneur motivations and which way one should go. And so frankly, I know I'm a VC. If I were a founder and could do an ICO, of course it's exactly what I would do. You know why? You don't have to deal with me. You don't have to give me 20% ownership in the company. You don't have me having these consent matters blocking things that you do. 
you could potentially raise more money with no dilution yes, and no controls. So it's a no-brainer to do an ICO if the money is out there. It, it turns out it was for a while. Now what we're seeing is we're seeing an evolution in the entire funding ecosystem where people are trying to bring the best of both worlds together. And I'm very fascinated by what that means going forward now. As you rightfully said, Sean, but unfortunately, a lot of the guys who get into the ICO space or develop or come up with a white paper don't have all the knowledge they require on their own. No man is an island, correct? So it's always nice to be able to build an ecosystem or allow them to get to where they want to get to by plugging in the right people with the right knowledge in the right space. So, um, yes, crowdfunding is an excellent idea, but sometimes they still need direction. What do you think, Andrea? Yeah, I mean, I feel uh, 2017 in particular was a phase where uh, you got many projects uh, um, claiming to have uh, um, utility tokens, but they were indeed, uh, in the end, uh, raising money as if they're selling a security. So I think uh, there is still a use case, of course, for utility tokens, and if there is a true decentralized nature of the platform, they should go forward. But I'm very interested in seeing how regulation will play a role in defining a clear line between security tokens and uh, utility tokens. In all the uh, blockchain events I'm joining, I see many companies now thinking about uh, security token exchanges, regulated exchanges to list security tokens. Um, so I do hope that uh, the next uh, phase will be a situation where uh, technology goes together with the regulation. A regulator is not uh, a roadblock, but is an enabler for the technology to flourish. And we do have uh, a clear uh, um, utility token route and as well a security Completely one. agree. I mean, the, where I come from, Moto, we're trying to spearhead a new legislation called the Virtual Financial Assets Act. And it's specifically for that we're trying to regulate the space. But then you get the other side of the coin, right? Where you get the libertarians telling you, listen, should we be regulating the space? I think we should, because um, when it comes to cross-jurisdiction, let's say, money flows, so institutional investment or consumer investment from different parts of the world, it's important to have at least a structure, a framework, where somebody's held accountable for what he's intending to do. If it fails, for example, we've heard of that German chap who launched an ICO. Um, <laughs> didn't he go to Malta? Uh, no, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't. <laughs> so he issued a white paper where he said, uh, you know, guys, buy my tokens, and I'll buy myself a new house, I'll buy my wife a car, and I'll buy my, my daughter a pony. And he gave everybody the results after they bought the tokens, and he literally showed them photos of his new house, his new car, and his new pony, because they didn't bother reading the white paper. So regulation is very, very important, and it will also help yeah. consumers eventually buy into something that matters. So I agree, I agree, 10,000 percent, right? And if you look at um, any new technology, regulation always lags behind how the market develops, right? And, and what we don't want is regulation to swing too far where it inhibits the market from growing. But um, you know, regulation exists for a very important reason. I mean, actually, so how many people have heard of the Howey test? Uh, in the audience, okay, a meaningful percentage. I mean, this is actually, this is the regulation that created the, the SEC in the US um, and, and try to define what is, a, what is a financial instrument versus not. And it actually comes from, from orange juice, um, oranges, orange groves in California in the 1930s. Um, and someone sold, uh, sold land, but in fact was selling future orange juice production against it. And they said, no, no, people it's are investing security. because they expect to get orange juice in the future. They're not ex investing in the land itself. Mm -hmm. And that became the definition was, are people investing with the expectation of future profit and future return? And if so, that is a security, and that should have regulation against there it. Yeah. Now, every single one of the ICOs that I received over the course of last year basically said you can achieve a 9,000% return. You can receive the average ICO is average this. So they were selling return and profit. So that absolutely 100% should be regulated because unfortunately, while they're very good people doing some amazing thing, in any new technology, people that rush in include some bad players. And it is the role of regulation actually to prevent people from getting uh, completely um, hurt yeah. uh, in this process. And regulation will also help if you introduce a pause button. So if there's an ICO that's out there in different jurisdictions and they're selling pea cakes, cheesecakes, what have you. And unfortunately, 
um, they are they have a, a bad past or they have an issue with, with, with their coin, then you can turn it off and stop from consumers from being constantly yep. um, bitten. And, and actually, I, I must say, just following up on that, I am. Um, what I find fascinating is I don't think tokens. Obviously, tokens have to do with, with, with blockchain, but I think the whole token world exists for, can exist in the future for any kind of business. I know we always try to draw this link between it's a blockchain company raising uh, money uh, and they've got their token, which is on the block. Uh, it, I actually don't care about that because I think it's a fundamentally different way to raise money with huge number of benefits for investors. Right, the number one thing is liquidity. As an equity investor, I invest, and my best companies take eight to ten years to get to fruition where I can maximize the value and the return mm -hmm. to myself. Now, there are more and more Quite bigger funds easy. doing secondary sales and so forth. Um, liquidity is a very good thing. It can also be a very bad thing at the same time, right? So I think you need to be aware of that. And having long-term investors locked up is, is, is beneficial to a business. That's why when companies go public, they go and speak to the big, big hedge funds and the big buyers, and they lock them in for a meaningful amount of time where they can't yeah. trade. But now, guess what? We're seeing tokens mimicking a lot of the benefits of equity as well, right? If you look at Filecoin, I invested $1,000 into it. I can't do anything with it right now. It doesn't really exist. I own it, but it's not coming out for a while. There's, there's lockup on the founders, so they can't get out of it. There's lockup on the investors. Um, there's all kinds of equity-style protections in place, the things that are good about equity in place. Yeah. Andre, that's actually a, a lead, lead us on to a good question. What do you guys actually look at um, when you're assessing an ICO, and how would you choose to fund it? I mean, I think uh, um, there are uh, all the things that you would look at uh, a normal project that doesn't even do an ICO. So, you know, of course, you look at, uh, you know, uh, the team, the business plan, and yeah. everything. Yeah. And then on top of that, you do look at the token economics and whether they do need a token or not. I think that's uh, the main element. Whether it fundamentally but, belongs on the blockchain. Yeah. But uh, um, what I also want to say is that we have seen uh, uh, lately uh, more projects, like the more serious projects, uh, um, pushing for either uh, very long you know, lockups on the tokens or even just doing uh, um, equity raise themselves. Just so you encourage that to... when, you, when you go? No, I wouldn't encourage that. I'm just saying that uh, in a phase where uh, there is a lot of uh, risk and uh, the regulatory framework is not yet clear, place. You, should be you should be careful. Yeah. And, uh, also, one thing you know that I see when I compare it with equity is that we should uh, basically we, we are in, at the model where uh, entrepreneurs with an ICO they normally raise what they need all up front at the beginning, yeah. uh, whereas an equity situation is a situation where you do that in stages, right? So based on the milestones that uh, you that achieve, you then you yeah. go to a higher valuation, you raise a bit more. So I feel that uh, we should all ask ourselves, you know, what are the implications of that, right? Will uh, someone be incentivized if you give you know, everything at the beginning and then the lockup expires and then what happens? So I think that we'll see ICOs and tokens uh, evolve not only from saying like being uh, regulated, but also probably um, like trying uh, to mimic elements no, of... It's an interesting uh, question how you, you, you mentioned the capitalization, how the, the difference that makes if you escalate the market cap in the beginning. Maybe the, the effect that it brings with, with, with buying, might, it might look bigger so it might encourage more, more purchases. But yeah, how about you? What do you think, Sean? Um, I was going to change topics just ever so slightly. I was Go thinking on. about some of these things about the market cap and what that means and what you were just saying. And so real life story. So there's a company I know very well. They raised, um, they could have ra they raised a Series A round from venture capitalists. Okay. Milestone based, they proved mm -hmm. something meaningful. They, they raised 5 million euros initially, so European based company. They then went out and they could have raised um, 10 million euros in Series B round. They instead did an ICO late last year. Mm -hmm. um, and a very clear reason why, because they had a product that actually worked incredibly well on blockchain, made a huge amount of sense. Um, with that, they created the foundation. They actually gave tokens to employees as well. Mm -hmm. Companies started, tokens started trading. You know what happened? Every single employee there, I heard this directly from the founder, had on the right, top right-hand corner of the screen exactly what their share of tokens was mm -hmm. worth. And you know what ha started happening in January and February and March and April is it kept going down and down and down and down and down, down 95% now. And do you know what that does to morale of a super early stage yeah. company yeah. where people are going, and it's, you know, the, exactly the, the average employee, like, I had a hundred, so I'm making 50,000 euros a year. I've now got 200,000 euros in tradable um, token value, and then that drops down to 5,000. Yeah. Huh. 
that's fucking miserable yeah, as, an, as an employee, right? <laughs> and, and so I think, once again, I just come back to, there's a lot of benefits to equity, and there's a lot of benefits to, to tokens, and I think we need, to, we need to recognize what are the pros and cons of each one and look to create hybrid structures that I think bring the best yeah. of both worlds together. Yeah. Because sometimes what you see is that you know, the token decreasing in value doesn't actually mean that the company's uh, not uh, sorry. Of course, the company's nothing. building product, they're getting out exactly. there, they're getting more developers into the, the platform, it's all going well. You're now separating the macro from the micro. The exactly. micro is the company is building and doing exactly what they should do. If this was a traditional venture backed company, the VCs would be like going, this is great. Employees would go, it's really growing great. We're going to go raise our Series e, C round in a year. And he's going, well, all of a sudden, you've now got the macro economic and crypto world impacting the small company that is still incredibly early. Yeah. <coughs> Completely agreed. I think that should cover the topic. If you guys have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. So there hasn't been much engagement now. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have a mic? You can yell. How do you feel about tokenized equity? Tokenized equity. I love the way you played with that one. Um, let's, let's put it this way. Tokenized equity. The way we normally attempt to help an ICO, so in answer to your question, is we look at it in two ways. We either pump fiat in the beginning to give them the monies they need to launch um, their framework, their ecosystem, their project. And then we normally take tokens as well. Why do I say this? Because we're very specific when we assess the ICO. We don't take on everybody. So if we like the project, then why not take tokens? So I don't know if that answers your question, but you've got the equity side covered and you're taking some tokens in the same project. It does help them because we take less ownership on the equity side because we believe in their project and take tokens instead. So their success is our success. Does that answer your question? I'm going to be more controversial. I think that's bullshit. <laughs> um, so I, you know what tokenized equity is? It's called a share that already exists. If for companies that are of certain value, you can buy and sell individual components all day long on the New York Stock Exchange, the LSE, the AIM, all these kind of things. Um, so anyway, that's. No, I'd like to separate the two. Yeah. As I said, that's how we take on the project. So you've got the fiat side. And I then like the second dance much better. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll be, sorry, I, uh, I, I'm purposely um, controversial on panel. I was trying to be politically <laughs> correct. <but> thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the reason why I'm asking this question is that to issue a token which attached to equity is much easier than to place a company in New York Stock Exchange. What, what does that mean? To issue a token attached to equity? So you're issuing equity that is just tradable from the day one? Yep. That's the second market had this in early yeah, yeah, stage yeah. companies. Like, I, I, that's great. It's Basically, a part of the security token idea. To try to access capital. Is it not a part of the security token idea? Um, yeah, I mean, but don't you think there might be some use cases for like security tokens, absolutely or tokenized kind of equity? Like, I agree. I agree with you that uh, not like we should move from a situation where we say everything should be tokenized, everything should be decentralized. There are some areas where it doesn't make sense. I mean, you've got areas, STOs and ICOs sense. now already regulated yeah. by SEC, right? You've got to go yeah, into yeah. a compliance process, yeah. AML process, due diligence process. So, mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's right on the mark when he says that because that's what's happening at the moment. Exactly right now. Singapore, Tokyo, Zug, yeah. Zurich, the United States, and us from Malta are trying to create a framework that will allow the institutional money flows on securitized tokens. Yeah. So you are right on the money. It's happening now. I, I do think that there might be some areas where it makes sense. I mean, if you think, for instance, at uh, real estate, like, like a sort of like tokenized version of real estate when I can buy a fraction of uh, uh, a property and then get the yield. You do have actually a company here in the UK which is very successful. Probably you know them. Property okay. partner. Exactly. That they're already doing that. Uh, and uh, yeah, but that's going the way it's real estate well. investment trust. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, I just view all this. I, I don't understand what the difference between tokenized equity and equity is. Yeah. Uh, I, I, maybe I'm being it's, really it's thick It's basically here. getting the, the, the tokens yes. regulated. <laughs> Great. And that basically, no. so, I, so the benefit is that it allows additional pools of capital to access that. Um, you make it smaller units that people can buy and sell. Exactly. Um, which, which basically brings more money in. And you allow earlier and stage companies access. to get access you to allow it, people, right? Yeah, exactly. um, I can really get that. I just don't think it's that revolutionary. I think there are so many cooler things we could be doing mm -hmm. with blockchain and tokens. Um, but, but don't just focus no, 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 on no. the ICOs. Don't forget the STO space, right? That's huge. 
Yep. And I mean, there's a lot of companies now completely focused on, on specific smart, uh, smart contracts mm -hmm. and proof of concept, and they're sandboxing amazing things. I mean, I've seen five or six projects, which I can't discuss publicly, but they are fantastic, and the things that are going to change um, globally with, with, these, with these instruments that are going to be under the SEC, com compliant and have passed AML and passed all due diligence processes in various jurisdictions. So I think it's, it's nice to have a, a sort of global regulatory framework to launch these things because you can control and more importantly um, regulate it the right way. But I, I do feel that, you know, I agree 100% with you, you should not sell it as if tokenized equity is the future, everything like Equity will not exist anymore, we will go towards tokenized equity, but for instance, when I think about real estate, I do see as a way to uh, democratize and make it more accessible access to, you know, if you want to buy like a very small portion of a certain property. Fra fractional in ownership, a, right? Exactly, uh, fractional ownership yeah. in a, a property like at the other side of the world, I can just do it on the blockchain without having an intermediary uh, taking a cut. So you can disintermediate that and uh, that's quite There are companies uh, doing that in unregulated spaces. So that's a problem as well. And, and how, there, how do you there regulate are real estate investment trusts where you can ready buy access house. to property. Uh, yeah. So you do have yeah. institutions, you do have yeah. uh, middlemen that are helping out that process, but I'm saying that you can try to disintermediate. No, no. And, and listen, the great thing about when traditional equity came into being, I mean, it goes back to the 15th century, Dutch East India Company, mm -hmm. but actually um, more recently in the 30s and 40s, was, you're right, it, it, it actually allowed anyone to get access to that, exposure to it. And, and the U.S. is still at the forefront where the average person in the U.S. owns stocks, right? The average person in the U.K. does not own stocks. They have a pension, and they, ha they don't have the access to the upside that potentially comes from that. So I do agree that the biggest benefit is that you basically allow people to get access to asset classes they couldn't otherwise get access yeah. to. Yeah. And that is hugely val val value, valuable. Um, but there's the SEC in the US which exists to regulate that. And I think it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of platform for regulation wins out, where, whether it's Malta or Zug or Singapore, or you know what, is it New York, London, because they actually play catch up very quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. I don't know what you guys think. Where's the place? Who wins? Yeah. Why, why does Malta win? Let me ask, well, let me ask <laughs> the moderator why Malta is gonna be the uh, um, because best we, place. I'm gonna be blunt. We grabbed the bull by the balls and told it where to go. Or the horns. Or the horns. <laughs> I would to grab him. <laughs> He'll be running at you the other way around. So basically, the most important thing with us is trying to create a framework that will allow institutional investment money to come into mm -hmm. not only Malta, because it, we shouldn't just be looking at Malta as the island it is, mm -hmm. but the fact that you're getting a country in the EU that's already pro the blockchain space and the DLT space and ICOs and STOs and regulating it. So if we open up that door, then we hope that members of the European Union will follow suit and it will make things and life much easier for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I think now you see like smaller countries uh, trying to take that as also, you know, a selling point to attract investors and interest in Malta is playing it uh, very well. And I hope that that will be just uh, um, an example then for also bigger countries to then also embrace blockchain and regulate it in a meaningful way. I think it's very important that uh, you know, we are in a phase where uh, markets are cooling down, regulation is coming up clearly, so people are a bit more, uh, you know, they're beyond this euphoria phase and they can focus on the value of the technology itself rather than yeah. sp speculating on the price. And it's also the best time for a fund uh, to deploy, right? Because you don't want to do that uh, when Bitcoin is at $20,000, you want to do that now. And in this situation... What is Bitcoin right at? now? <laughs> <laughs> the last 20 minutes. Oh, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I think that, that should... Uh, is that our time? That's our time, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much.